welcome aboard <coughs> to a mighty bit. If I'm just going to make sure that guitar doesn't feed back again, so that's good. Oh, it's warm up here. It's warming up now, it's isn't it? It's fucking freezing out there. I know, yeah. I know. <coughs> I think it's the Holy Spirit is amongst us now. Now we've got lights. Oh, it's lights, <laughs> yeah, we're good this side, huh? Yeah. Mike, it's a real pleasure to get you here fairly short notice, and um, a man I've known on and off over the last half dozen years or so, but um, really looking forward to having a chat with you about your life, your work, and the myriad of things that you do and you've done. And um, uh, if we could just get a little bit of background. I know you're born in Carlisle, but went off to Africa very, very young, Kenya, mm -hmm. and why? I, I can do that really quickly. Born in Carlisle, <clears throat> six months old, I went to Nairobi because my father was Irish colonial middle class, British public school educated. My mother was working class. Um, he was a pilot during the war, kind of a party boy. Mm -hmm. Wanted to be a jazz pianist, never quite settled. Um, went back to his parents' home, which was Nairobi. Had a party for about eight years. <clears throat> um, we left under a blanket, me and the five kids and the parents. Um, there was a lot of people after him, I think. Where was this? Uh, this is in the 50s? <clears throat> this is in the 19th century sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, back in that, yeah, Is this Mau Mau time? Is this Mau, Mau, oh, yeah, Mau, yeah. Mau, yeah. yeah. And then, um, then we went to live with my gran in Carlisle in a terrace house. Right. They wouldn't let him in the house because he was a bad boy. And I went from, you know, servants, cars, swimming pools into um, basically Coronation Street. It looks exactly like that. Yeah. Fantastic one terraced row of houses off Dale Street uh, with four or five relatives living in the street. My gran had the bathroom, so they used to come once a week, take turns yeah. for the big bath yeah. and, and stuff. She had the posh house and um, lived there for about a year and my dad got a job as a journalist, then we moved over to Newcastle, which That's is really where I... Right, and so your, your education was in Newcastle, in the North East Mall, was it by, by, yeah. by the time you were into sort of... Sort of um, 10 to 18, yeah. which, uh, when yeah. I came down to London. And you, you were a fairly prodigious musician very early on, weren't you? You are very proficient, you, you played trumpet, obviously, you played guitar, you played um, keyboards. Yeah, I started on drums when I was 10. Um, I made a drum kit out of... Um, I, Actually, Ian Carr, the great yeah. British jazz trumpet yeah. player, was my English teacher at school. Uh -huh. uh, he was an Watt English teacher? He was my English teacher, like one of the, 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 wrote the definitive book on Miles Davis. I went to a comprehensive school. My art teacher was Johnny Walters, <laughs> who was John Peel's producer, <laughs> also a very good trumpet player. Um, yeah, he played with Alan Price, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, absolutely. And my games teacher was a trad jazz cornetist. <laughs> so I had three trumpet players, by coincidence. You couldn't go and wrong, could you? Couldn't go wrong. And Ken Olmston, who was the music teacher, who was a, like a Gilbert and Sullivan nut, he kind of mentored me as a, as a musician. Yeah. Actually got me into music college yeah. through lying. Basically. So are you a believer, as, as, as I am, and I know a lot of, um, a, a, a lot of artists are, there, there is this one person or this couple of teachers who turn on the light for you at sure. school, and it, yeah. and it burns for the rest of your life, that light, doesn't it? <clears throat> Also, I mean, going, being dropped into uh, Newcastle, we lived in a council house in, on a council estate in Kenton, um, was such a far cry from Nairobi. And also learning Geordie, which is like a, it's a different language. Yeah, yeah. I spent the first couple of months saying, excuse me, I didn't quite catch that. And then you get like, <laughs> you know. You said you know, lose, you, you said learn to lose that. You learn Geordie ever so quick. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a great place. Newcastle's still like a spiritual home. So did you, did you pick up Swahili or? or, or I spoke fluent Swahili when I came back to Carlisle. Very like, useful in Carlisle, really, I imagine, yeah. And not a lot of use in Newcastle, actually. <laughs> so I swapped that, you know, as the brain does for Geordie, I became, and forgot Wolf Swahili. Um, yeah, and then uh, had my formative, you know, 10 to 18, um, Growing up, started playing the drums. From Ian Carr gave me a, a yeah. snare drum, and I got biscuit tins and things. Yeah. My dad used to make me like a performing dog, drum to Benny Goodman, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington. He was a fantastic teacher and would teach me to listen to drummers and yeah. bass players yeah. in particular. And say that the reason why this band swings is because you can't hear the drummer and stuff like that. Yeah. Then to impress him, I. I started playing trumpet when I was 11. He then used to make me jam with Louis Armstrong. So did you have, did you have formal music lessons, the, the trumpet lessons? Yeah, trumpet piano lessons, lessons, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and um, 
sort of basically learned to li read trumpet, you know, but I know I still struggle with the bass clef. Uh, were, you, were you listening to jazz mainly then? All the time. Yeah, yeah, All yeah, the time. yeah, that was your thing. Nothing, uh, right up to Charlie Parker, and yeah. then it was a cut-off point for, yeah. for my dad. Amazing record collection, which I now own, 78 old yeah. beats. And he was a kind of a frustrated DJ, so he'd play stuff all the time, and yeah. he'd test me and say, okay, right, who's on clarinet? <laughs> and what year was this recorded? And I knew the answers by the time yeah, I was about yeah. 12, 13. Yeah. And then, then so did you, did completely you... useless information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it comes to question time, try me, you know. <laughs> Who was that I... clarinet player, by the way? Um, did, did you start playing in bands very early on? Did yeah. You? yeah. School band. School bands. And you yeah. played in a band with Brian Ferry, didn't you? Certainly did. The gas board. Before the gas the... board. <laughs> the gas board. <laughs> the gas board. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, was, was he a um, singer? Or was he, uh... he was uh, the singer. Yeah. Was he still? Uh, in, 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 that, uh, in that style? Or? Oh, he was. <laughs> yeah. We fired him because he wasn't really the first great move of my career. Yeah. <laughs> because he wasn't cutting it in the working man's clubs. So, yeah. And actually, Ian But Watts, he's never going to do anything, is he? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, and then I, and you know, he, uh, he then came down to London the same time as I was down here. And I went to the first rehearsals of Roxy Music and I thought, he's still not going to make this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll join a people show and still do the performance art and not make any money for a while. But you, were, you weren't involved in, in, in the Newcastle um, University no, art, I was, art faculty I was, crowd with Richard Hamilton and that mob. Was, they were. They were, weren't they? John yeah. Porter, they were in the fine art department. Yeah. Very really interesting, the period of obviously rock and roll and fine art. And yeah. uh, I was in a local band called The Colts doing cover versions of Beatles songs, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they, but playing trumpet as well, Herb Alpert I used to do. Yeah. And, uh, do you still do Spanish Flea? Or? Uh, hang on. <laughs> I oh, this could be a treat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, That's a uh, yes thing. <laughs> yeah, it's all there, just like the useless information. It never yeah. leaves. Isn't that fantastic? Some muscle, people can just drop it. Muscle and memory. Move on, you know, I must say, that wasn't set up. I didn't know that he could still. <laughs> I can play that on a comb and tissue paper, but that's about it. Um, um, so they heard me playing the trumpet and they needed a brass section, basically. Yeah. And there weren't a lot of trumpet players around. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah. I was like the junior member in the gas board. And then that became a fantastic band. Um, came down to London. It was one of the main bands in Newcastle. Came down to London for a recording contract and stood up about five weeks later. Yeah, of course. Yeah, did. yeah. And soon after that, did you join the, the People Show soon after that? Or that well, I went to uh, study music as a music teacher uh, at a place, what's now Middlesex University, but it was called Trent Park. Really right, yeah. Sort of like music, art and drama yeah. college. Very good. Um, did my three years there and actually started playing with a free jazz group called The People Band, mm -hmm. who played with The People Show. They had a monumental row over not being able to be heard because the fucking musicians wouldn't shut up. <laughs> and I kind of agreed with them, actually. So I joined the People Show as their resident musician. Yeah. And then... A lot of you here are obviously not, not old enough to um, remember the People Show. The People Show were a, a great and, and, and absolutely groundbreaking uh, experimental theatre group that started, I think, in the 60s and, and, and certainly went on through the 80s, didn't they, for yeah, 20, 20 years? And they used to no, tour it every now. year. They're still going. Still, still around. They just still have around. their grant chart. Again and they have that, that, that rehearsal space in off Bethnal Green Road, still and they are still there. Which, luckily, they own. That is now what they're That's kind That's their of bread and butter, isn't it? That they, they, yeah, they rent it out. Um, they started as, uh, basically, Jeff Nuttall, yeah. um, who was... Uh, kind of significant British artist, again, a poet, jazz musician, um, very influenced by, you know, the beats and by the New York happening movement. Mm -hmm. So the first people shows were, it's called people show because it was a people show in the basement of a bookshop called Better Books. In yeah, Cross Road. Road, yeah, And so they were, they were happenings. It wasn't a theater group. It was a, it was a happening group. And then they did another couple more and then they, they sort of consolidated that thing and started, every show was just called a number. So I came in at about people show, fuck, I don't know, like 24 or something. Mm. And I think I left when I people show 62. Or All something. right, so you were with them for a long time. How long were you Ten with years. them? 10 years. 10 years. On the road. But how did that transition from being in the band to being on stage as a, as a performer happen? Like a Judy Garland story. Um, 
There was an amazing festival at the Royal Court called the Come Together Festival um, in the early 70s. Um, and pretty much everybody who was interesting was kind of invited to come and do something in the various Royal Court spaces and in Sloan Square. And we were one of the groups invited. And in the weeks prior to that, there were again two more monumental rows and two of the performers walked out. I was basically in there to play a bit of guitar and trumpet or whatever, and I was just like, now actually you're now having to perform um, wearing a dress. And uh, <laughs> fuck, why not? Mick Jagger in the audience, everybody is like, it was the coolest you know, thing at the yeah. time. And I went on and Mark Long, who was the main like, improvising voice, kind of a brilliant genius improviser, uh, he and I kind of hit it off as a kind of um, bizarre Morkum and Wise double act. I, yeah. I, I enjoyed feeding Mark yeah. the correct lines at the right time. Kind of musical thing, really. So they were loosely structured, the pieces, were they? Yeah. Loose is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they weren't were scripted as such, but loose, yeah. loosely no, structured. No, there was a structure. And um, a lot of, interestingly, when I left the People Show and went into, let's say, other structures of work, I was always really shocked by that I didn't think people worked hard enough. Because yeah. we would literally sit in a room for five days, caffeined and, and nicotined up to the hill, you know, until we got a structure. It might be based on this image, this sound design, a piece of music, or an idea that someone had. And in the group was a crazy Mexican guy called Jose Nava. Mark, who was this amazing improviser. A sort of very striking girl called Laura Gilbert, who, uh, who had the most powerful no I've ever heard. She always used to say, no, I don't like it. And I was like, okay, that's shit, moving on. It's like she was the, the grail of yes or no. Yeah. Um, and, we'd, and I became the notebook keeper, which yeah. is, I think, how I learned to be a director, yeah. really. And w w was all the work sort of devised by the company, or was, it, was there a sort of leader who said, we're going to do this no, piece? And no, that? absolutely directorless, yeah. and that was great. Yeah. Although at certain points, somebody might have a stronger opinion and say, I, you know, how about this structure? But there was never a person who said, there was never a boss. And it's quite interesting, a lot of the kind of more experimental aspects of like British theatre at the time, yeah. the sort of, um, you know, Max Stafford Clarks and the sort of, these kind of more edgy, let's say, but conventional theatre companies would come and see the work. And they, in the bar afterwards, they'd kind of go, so come on now, so who, who actually directed that? And you go, no one, that mm. was a collective thing. And they couldn't get their chops around that at all. You know, they, they, they felt we were, I was, holding something back, I wasn't telling them the whole truth. Because mm. the idea of collective working and, and not having a leader is, uh, is very strong, but very rare. I was there more of a circuit where you could show that work in sure. those days than there is now, do you think? <clears throat> yeah, very Experimental strong. drama. Is... Well, funny enough, the Hampstead Theatre Club was very exper uh, experimental. Mm. Uh, the ICA, of course. Roundhouse, I suppose. The Roundhouse yeah. for some venues, the Oval Theatre. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, quite a few venues. And then, you know, Birmingham had an arts lab. London had two yeah, arts, arts labs, lab, yeah, yeah. and then the most important influence, and if you talk to anybody from that period, was a place called the Mickery Theatre in Amsterdam, yeah, yeah, yeah. a guy called Ritzart Ten Carter, and he basically became a kind of world curator for Mabu Mimes, Robert Wilson, for yeah. uh, Milwaukee uh, experimental troops, Willem Dafoe I met there, you know, and yeah. there'd be this incredible ongoing traffic through the Mickery Theatre yeah. in Amsterdam, yeah. it's converted cinema. Their first ever show, Nina Simone came and did a performance, and that ran for quite a while. Um, and even after I left the People Show, they commissioned my first solo piece and so on. So what, you left the, uh, the People Show and for Mike Well, Fingers, finally, we Mike, had a row, you know, <laughs> after 10 years yeah. of like a rock band, and uh, it, became, it became less possible to... Things were changing. And so I... Uh, well, I decided I, I was... Then I started to shoot little things on... Super 8, and I decided I would go to film school. Yeah. You know, I, not I might, I decided I would go to, yeah. you know, because we were such a cool group. And was it, there was just one, was there? That well, it was Beaconsfield, yeah. which is where I wanted to go, London which Film School, still, which still you there, had to pay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I went and had like the worst, most disastrous interview, well, actually one of many, um, but this was particularly bad. Uh, David Putnam was on the panel, and he and I just did not get on. <laughs> from literally the moment I sat down, he said, yeah, so you're from experimental theatre. What makes you think that there's any relationship between experimental theatre and cinema, or the film business? Yeah. And I said, well, what a strange question, you know, and so on. It got worse and worse yeah, and worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ozzy Morris, one of our most famous cameramen, who was a 
very conservative guy, putting it in one way, um, was again sort of, so you've shot on Super 8. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> have you ever shot on a, like a grown-up camera? And I said, no, no, I haven't. You know? <laughs> so when I finally finished the interview, I realized in retrospect, you know, the point where I plunged the dagger into my own um, abdomen was when so he said, so if you don't get into film school, Mr. Vickers, what, what do you intend to do? And I went, I'll just make a film. And Isaac Morris said, but you just told us you don't even know how a 16 millimeter camera works. And I said, it can't be that difficult. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and you know what? It is not. It's, like, it's a clockwork piece of metal. Yeah. It's a clock. So you, you got a place there or you didn't? I didn't. You no. didn't, no, no, no. <laughs> I just no. want to clear that up. No, I didn't get in. I now teach uh, there, um, but uh, that's like. Well, no wonder your career stymied so. That's uh, actually, uh, yeah, yeah. But I did. I, I, <laughs> I did. Then I, I'd left the people show. I didn't have a job, so I called up Ritzart in Amsterdam and yeah. said, you know, I want to do, a, I want to do a kind of an experimental theatre piece with a film as the centre of it, you know, as part of the whole structure. And you know, God bless him, he came up with. Um, I think seven or eight thousand pounds. Wow! Um, and a little bit of money from the Arts Council, and I got the ICA. John Ashford was there at the time to co-produce. And with that budget, I made a forty-minute, sixteen-millimeter film. And you were bitten by the bug, presumably by then. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, I was never that like. I never was like, oh, I was born to make films. Films are interesting. I let me put that in perspective. But so is photography, and so is music. Sure. And I've always like struggled. You've always way. kept the, both both things going, haven't you? Well, it was hard once I accidentally became successful as a filmmaker, you know, um, because then you get, you know, you are placed on a train, almost like, and you're not arguing because they suddenly start paying you shitloads of money, mm. which is sort of totally out of your perception of what you were worth in the first place. So, and then. The thing in big films, growing up films, is if you don't have your next film by the time you're in post-production, you're you're a loser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I stayed on that train, and that, you know, and I started to get beaten up by that system, and I, I kept pondering, well, mm. you know, mm. why am I doing this? I don't know how to get off. Actually, did you did you start off in TV or did you go no. straight into no no you couldn't so, get you couldn't get into TV. Yeah. So um, your first feature was Stormy Monday. I did a film for Channel 4, right. let's, uh, let's put that in its correct place. Without Channel 4, I wouldn't be probably talking about film. Now. Right. And nor would a lot of other filmmakers like Neil Jordan and so on. I mean, yep. that period when Walter Donny, who was one of the commissioning editors, David Rose, actually was like the one lifeboat in the British yep. film industry yep. that where you saw it. The work was actually getting made, wasn't it, as well? It wasn't you, just being talked about over long lunches. Yeah. And Peter Greenaway and Draftsman's Contact, all that stuff. You could actually get a film made. Yeah. They had money and they had some kind of commitment to, mm. to new work. Mm. So they, um, they commissioned a film based on a performance piece I'd done at the ICA called uh, Slow Fade and it became known as The House and I, uh, that was my first one hour film. Right. Roger Deakins, great cinematographer, he shot yeah. it. I had, yeah. you know, I had an amazing cast, Stephen Ray and all kinds of people, um, you know. And you've always managed to get an amazing cast, haven't you? Yeah. Sometimes you've got them almost by default, to scroll forward a bit, and, and you're doing um, Stormy Monday, you picked up two actors whose trajectory was very much on the down or on the flat, with Tommy Lee Jones and uh, Melanie Griffith, didn't you? Mm. And, and, and presumably got them at a very good rate for what was essentially a, 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 something of an independent sort of sure. budget film. Well, Melanie you got Sean Melanie Reed, and you had... got Sting, so I mean, yeah. That's, that's quite a cast for, for, for a first feature, isn't it? Yeah, but that was two and a half to three years uh, of hustling, during which time I, t I began teaching, you know, just to get some money. But, um, and Melanie's trajectory had dropped, yeah. but then she did that film with Ray Liotta, that uh, Johnny, Jonathan Demme movie, you know. Yes. And suddenly the studio or the company that were saying, no, she's, they were so derogatory about her, I won't use the C word, but they, that's how they described her, that dumb C. And then the movie came out and the same guy said to me, we love Melanie Griffiths. You know? <laughs> and what do you feel about her? And I'd already said, I, cause I'd seen her actually in that rear window remake, you know, that, um, I thought she was great. Yeah. 
And when I'd first suggested her, they said, no, that dumb C. And now they said, we love her. What do you think about her? And I went, I'd learned from the film school experience to keep the mouth shut sometimes. And I went, that is a great idea. Great idea of yours, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As in, I wish I had thought of yeah, that yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's usually, that's really helpful, actually. I realized that. But to, you did the music for that too, didn't mm -hmm. you, for Stormy Monday? Yeah. Uh, lovely, lovely soundtrack, I must say. Again, Jazzy, the luck yeah. of low budget is if you say, I'm going to write, direct, and do the score, they kind of go, they're obviously to themselves, they go, is that one fee or three? <laughs> and then, I think that's just one fee. He'll take it because he's a loser, you know, he hasn't got a track record. Yeah. And, I, and I did. So my first film, I, I got away with um, being able to score it. That's a whole story because that's been the struggle is, is hanging on to the ownership, the psychological ownership of the film through the music. Yeah. Me, the most important thing is, you know, maybe is the music in a film. That's the thing that can make it go one way or the other. Um, and I, after that, I really struggled. To yeah. So Stormy Monday was, uh, uh, made a big enough splash to get you over to Hollywood and to, to... No, it bombed here and got terrible reviews and derogatory reviews from the British film press, but got a great review in the New York Times and the LA Times on the strength of that, I got an agent, right. and Clint Eastwood offered me a film, uh -huh. um, which was really a bad script, so I turned it down. He's never spoken to me since. But um, I got, and then I started working on a film called The Hot Spot, which Dennis Hopper ended up directing, <clears throat> um, which fell apart. I had it set to go with Sam Shepard. How was Dennis at that point? Was he I, I never, I never crossed over, because basically, my version of it fell apart, okay, and then yeah. he came in and did his version of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, the, 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 the first big film that really sort of made a huge splash for you, obviously, was um, Leaving Las Vegas, which... No, not really. Was it not? No, Internal Affairs was what... Was that a bigger film? The, well, no, let's say it's all relative, and if you put it in the time zone, I did Stormy Monday, got nice reviews, like a cool British art house movie, the guy might have potential. On the strength of that, I ended up fighting tooth and nail and getting internal affairs with Richard Gere and Andy right. Garcia. And that was big. I mean, that made money, it was paramount. And it put me into a place with American actors where I could kind of, you know, I got people like Sean Penn coming up to me going, I want to work with you, and you. never yeah. did. Um, uh, you know, people coming up to you in restaurants, so introducing themselves, and you're kind of going, actually, I, I know who you are because you've made 400 films, and, <laughs> you know, blah, blah, blah. Were you blah. living out there then? Or I was commuting, yeah, 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 which is what I continued to do. Yeah. You know. um, so that took me to there, and then with this really silly idea that really filmmaking was a piece of piss, you know, because I'd made one film and then I made my second film and suddenly I was somebody. Yeah. You know, I then proceeded to make an art house film, which three people saw, Liebestraum. I then did an agonizing film called Mr. Jones, which yeah, was two and a half years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I then f struggled with Ridley Scott, my producer, on the Browning version, and you know, did an HBO film, got that totally fucked up by them as well. So it was like downhill, 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 and then leaving Las Vegas. Right. So it's about a 10-year gap. Actually. How did you find that book? It's John O'Brien's autobiography, wasn't it, basically? Pretty much, yeah. Um, how, did, how did you find it? Was it, was it um, did it find you? Or, or? It did. It was a very nice piece of um, serendipity, actually, because I was stuck on this film, which I could talk about badly for a long time, called Mr. Jones about a manic depressive. And having made a successful film with Richard, I then teamed up with him again, and realized that my version of manic depression was not the Hollywood version of manic depression, mm -hmm. to the extent that halfway through this nightmare post-production, the head of the studio rang me up and said, have you seen the trailer we've cut for your film? And I went, no, I haven't yet. And he said, take it a look at it. It'll give you an idea of the film you're supposed to be making. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is like almost, uh, you know, Confucius like. And it's, and it's you got the message, truth. did you? Yeah, it's also true. And then the same guy, I think, said to my agent, problem with Mike is he doesn't understand the social contract. Also true, you know. And in that period of, you know, fighting a battle which I knew I was going to lose and so on, a very great friend of mine, um, Stuart Reagan, who was a rare thing in LA. He was a cool gallerist 
who represented Matthew Barney at that time. All right, yeah. Okay. And one of my favorite moments in all time, all time in Hollywood was going to a prestige screening of um, one of the Cremaster, which nobody knew anything about, but everybody turned up thinking, well, I've had this really cool film, you know? Yeah. And they showed it in the state-of-the-art Paramount screening theater. And I just loved, I sat at the back and just watched the audience go, what the? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, is there a story? Because I, did I miss something, you know? Yeah. People slithering around in yellow slime. Yeah, exactly, and Vaseline and uh, yeah, Amy Mullins doing the potato thing. So, um, Stuart, um, who had become a friend and really just a lovely guy, um, said, I've got a book that I'd love to give you, which I got in a second-hand bookstore in Santa Monica, and he gave it to me. I carried it around in my bag for about two months, and he was very sweet. He kept saying, you have a chance to read the book yet? And I said, no, but I promise I will. And I looked at it, it looked really kind of like, oh, my God, depressing, yeah. you know? It is, yeah. And then um, finally I thought, guilt. I'll, I'll read the fucking book. So at least I can say I read it, you know, yeah. because he's a friend. And yeah. that's the hardest thing when friends give you a script I wrote. Yeah, 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 of course. You know, and so, I've got uh, something I want to give you at the end. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'll read it. Okay. <laughs> and anyway, I read it. And within, a, within about 10 pages, I thought this is so fucking dark. <laughs> so dark. And depressing and sexy and juicy. This is a film that could never, ever get financed in Hollywood. Well, this is what I was going to Therefore, ask you. When you I'll look do at it. that, and, yeah. and, and, and obviously <laughs> read, read your screenplay too, yeah. you just think it will never, ever get made. You have the Ben character, Nicolas Cage's character, mm. without a single redeeming feature from beginning to end, it ends badly. It starts at the most excruciating <laughs> opening ten minutes of any film I've yeah. ever seen. You watch it like, oh, please don't do and throughout, I mean, Elizabeth Shue gives a lovely performance. It's very, you know, warm-hearted, tart with the heart, sensitive and all that. And you just think, somewhere along the line, he's going to come good. And every time you see him, you think, please don't fuck up this time. <laughs> and he does. And he does it every yeah, yeah. time. As I said, by the time I got to the end, I thought, it's great. It's kind of Teflon <laughs> coated. Yeah. It's, it's Hollywood resistant, you know. It's a feel-bad movie. <laughs> Feel good about feeling bad. Well, yeah. Yeah. But how did you sell it? Were they looking for the no, last page and think, no. oh, Mike, we think we must have lost the last page because in our last page he dies. Yeah. Um, I think it was cathartic to do it. And it was an incredibly interesting exercise in converting a, a novel like this, which is pretty much all interior dialogue, into something called a film script, mm. which I did in three stages over a period of about a year. There was no rush. I was being beaten up every day and being paid for it, so it was okay. Um, but close, you know, then I'm falling more and more in love with the material, kind of recognizing all the elements in literature that I loved in Scott Fitzgerald or the existentialists. Or, but at the same time, it was an American, you know, the thing that we love about America, which is this sort of depressing, well, the European version of America. Mm. That it's depressingly beautiful somehow. Mm. Um, and finally arrived at a screenplay, and I sort of started sending it out. Nicolas Cage responded immediately and actactually faxed me pre, you know, email -y sort of stuff. Was he your first choice? Pretty, I met a lot of people like John Cusack, you know, like blah, 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 to talk, maybe listen to him talking about himself, yeah. you know, and, and another film he wanted to make and so on. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. Coffee's cheap. And um, then, and I was just kind of way just like, you know, kind of throwing it out there yeah. gently. And yeah. then Nick responded by saying, I beg you do not give this to anybody else. I will pay to be in the film. Please, please do not give it to anybody else. I'd already offered the part to Elizabeth Shue because I'd met her a couple of years earlier on right. another film and yeah. I always liked, I loved Adventures in Babysitting. I thought she'd be perfect yeah. as a prostitute. Yeah. And, you know, and, um, You're a sick man. Yeah. <laughs> I just knew she had the heart. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, some you get that off some actors. Yeah. That they they have heart, yeah. and I knew that I needed heart from her because I wasn't yeah. going to get it from. I was going to get alcoholism from Nick, you know. So um, he was in place, and that kind of now he was not a named actor. In yeah. fact, Paramount had a policy: no Nick Cage movies at that time. <laughs> he will not be the lead in any of our films. Right. And he was famous for being quirky, off the wall, doing yeah. cameos in low budget movies, you know. So um, he wasn't really something that was going to sell the script on top of the script, you know. So then. Um, At that time, did you get Coppola on board 
if you got Nick Cage on board, was there any sort of no, family? No, uh, no, 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 nothing. Not a, not a whimper of no. interest. Um, I had in the meantime done the Browning version, uh, which is a film I love, I have to say, and I, it, it was in competition at Cannes. And so they paid for my hotel, swish, suite, the whole thing. And then on top of that, they asked me to do a shitload of press because it was in competition. So I did a deal with them. I said, if I do those four days of press, if I do them in two days as a kind of marathon, you know, is that okay? So they crammed them all in. It was the most surreal experience. And the two days I had left, I went with my new agent, who I had no idea if he was going to be any good at all. He was the, just another strange Hollywood agent. You know, they're strange. And uh, we went on this mad trip around the harbor and the back corridors of the hotels where all the porn yeah, yeah. You know, uh, companies are and all of that to every little piss pot company that possibly we could talk to and ended up on a yacht with a, a company, a French company um, with two people around it who were as batty as they come, snakes, you know, I mean, they were crazy. But they said they liked it and said mm. they were going to do it. And literally within eight weeks, we're in, I think we're in pre-production with these Amazing. crazy people. And was there was it pressure on you to rewrite the screenplay with a happy ending at any point? Or, or at least no. a, a, a sniff of redemption or of transcendence? No, no, no they're Never. French. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> they were French. That's what I mean. They weren't Americans. They didn't want him to survive. <laughs> the one tussle we had, which is really interesting, is I realized about a week before we were starting to shoot, I read the script again and I got really nervous because the lack of, you know, redemption or anything. And also because the script, based on the novel, didn't have a lot of dialogue about their feelings. Their feelings. And so <clears throat> I thought, you know, I need to know more about him. And so I came up with the idea, which is in the film, of that Elizabeth Shue, she talks to a therapist and, you know, um, articulates her feelings that she would never say to him. Right, yeah. So we know she cares. Yeah. And that, I would say, was the reason he got the Oscar, was because of what she said about him. She allowed the audience to have a feeling. Mm. So I suggested to the absolutely insane producer, Leela, um, I said, oh, you know, I've had this idea, thinking, you know, the gratitude would flow from her. Like, uh, you know, I'd added some redemption. She went, no. That is not the script we bought, and uh, <laughs> I am the producer, and you've done a change of word, you know, and fuck, so, right. right. How do I do this? So Shades I thought, of black, yeah. So I, I, I did a trick. We did a camera test the day before we started shooting, and I, I said secretly to Elizabeth, I gave her all these pages from the book, and I said, just read them, don't memorize them, and I'm going to interview you as a camera test. Mm -hmm. And so I snuck it in as the camera test, told her to bring loads of different clothes to wear, so we had some time. Yeah, 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 she yeah, wasn't yeah. in one long session, but she went several times. And, um, and then got that footage, thank God, and then had a monumental struggle in you know, Final Cut. Yeah. So I had Final Cut, but she argued quite rightly, you have Final Cut on the script I approve, not the one you added to. And I, you know, I really, really had to fight for that and mm. find it. Thank God I, mm. won, I won that battle because it really makes to me the difference between the film being interesting art house, yeah. non redemptive death yeah. fest, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, um, or something that has some heart, you know. Yeah. And uh, were you always going to do the music for that yourself from sure. day one? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> here's a funny one. Um, because of being a sort, of a sort of a Geordie and having worked with Sting, I. I was obviously struggling soundtrack-wise, you know, and I had no money, there was nothing in the, in the budget. So I rang up Sting and I said, can you, I have a huge favor to ask, I've made a really low budget film, and um, I'd love you to sing three ballads, you know, standard ballads, 20th century ballads, My One and Only Love, mm -hmm. Lonesome Old Town, and um, Angel Eyes. Mm -hmm. all, all very kind of Vegasy, you know. Yeah. And he said, okay, um, can you find a pianist? And I, you know, I, I mean, you organize it. So I found a great pianist, Dave Hartley, and a great bass player. And we went up to his mansion, and I took a recording guy with me. And, and in his sort of living room on his lovely Bosendorfer, we, in about three hours, recorded the tracks. Right? Beautiful and performances. Something as bingo, well. bingo, you know, payday. So yeah. I put them on, they worked beautifully, yeah. showed the cut to the crazy Leila. And I get a phone call from her, LA to London, saying, We don't like the soundtrack. You know, and I went, 
My music. She went, now your music is okay. But <laughs> I, I played it to my mother. She doesn't like Sting. And I went, I said, what? <laughs> she said, no, we don't like Sting. I went, but Leela, it's about a million dollars worth of free music. That's what his market value is, you know. And he's quite famous. You know? yeah. It might help the film. And whether your mum likes it or not, I mean, could we put that aside? No, I don't like music. So I thought, again, that thing of like, you've got to play the game, right? So I was in. Okay, I'll call you back. So I had to think, and I called her back from the editor room and said, Okay, I've had an idea. Okay, <clears throat> I understand you don't like staying, that's a personal thing. Um, but when I had my own theatre group, I, I, you know, I wrote an opera in German about death. And um, three of the songs from that, particularly Ich Wein um meine Eltern, I weep for my parents, yeah. Unendlich Schwarzhole, <laughs> Infinite Black Hole, and <laughs> catchy numbers by this really catchy. I said, I think that in a way you're right. They're more perfect and they're mine, so I'm not going to charge you. And she went, and who would sing them? <laughs> and I went, I would, of course. <laughs> she said, I'll call you back. <laughs> and then she called me back and said, okay, we go with Sting. And I went, I'm so offended. You know? <laughs> And during the filming of that, or during pre-production, during um, pre-production, John O'Brien died, didn't he? Yeah, he, he did the, it. The, yeah. the guy he who wrote the book? He shot himself, yeah. I did you meet him? I was due to meet him a week later, yeah. Did he, had he seen your screenplay? Or? Yeah, he was okay. He'd signed off in there. Too. Well, there's okay, there's okay, <laughs> my God. It's okay. <laughs> I really like it, yeah. yeah. It's Excuse Sting, Sting killed him, I guess. Yeah. No. <laughs> So there you are, you've done, you've done this movie, you've, you've completed it, you've written it, you've done the music for it, you've, you've, you've di directed it, and here you are. You shot it on 16 mil as well, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I love 16 <coughs> And at the end, come, come January, February the next year, you're up for four Oscars. Well, it, what happened was we finished it, we cut it here in, um, in uh, just off Carnaby Street, and uh, then tried to sell it, you know, which had farce all over it. I mean, you know, everyone kind of loved it, but, you know, and then got a call from the Weinstein boys, Harv, saying, we would love to see it, bring it to New York. So I flew on Concord <laughs> to New York right. with a, um, a beta SP copy of the, of the film, off, straight off the Avid, and turned up I think at like by 10 in the morning at the, at the Miramax office. And they were late. They were like an hour late. Uh -huh. um, they lived there. And um, <laughs> so, all right, disrespectful, I thought. You know. Anyway, we went into this sort of screening room type thing with a crappy little TV. This is much nicer. Mm. And um, they stuck it in, and all the paranoid executives in there kind of twitching, you know. Harvey sitting there, you know, and uh, and we watched it, and I was just—it's an awful experience watching your work with Harvey Weinstein or any, anybody, but Harvey Weinstein is particularly painful, you know, and just to the point where, you know, she decides to go back and find Nick, you know, and they're going to consummate their love. He kind of goes, "Can you just hit the pause button there? I have to take a very personal call." <laughs> And he left the room, and then everybody left the room, you know, and then, uh, you know, I was like, fucking hell. You still had time to change the ending at this point. Yeah. I never thought of that. that maybe that was the trouble. Anyway, finally, after 20 minutes or so, they came back, and he went, okay, hit the button, and I thought, fuck you. Uh, I said, excuse me, I have to pee. I'll be right back. <laughs> Hold it there. And I just went and stood outside. Like, Five minutes. I'm going to give it like seven, eight. You know, I was like, how long can I, how long can a pee take? You know, and then I came back and said, okay, oh, it's better. Hit the button. You know, by which time, you know, any kind of atmosphere. And it was in a room with sunlight streaming through. It was in their lobby oh, basically. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, about yeah, as yeah. sexy as uh, you know a hospital. And uh, then he went, okay, it's great, it's a great movie. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Leela, let's talk business. And he offered like ten bob for it. You yeah. know. Well, we, Harvey, we need more than that, I think, you know, you know. Well, that's my final offer, you know. It was great. So it was great he didn't buy it. Yeah. We were fucked because we didn't have anybody else. But then <laughs> MGM bought it, at which point Leela rang up the head of MGM and said, OK, Mike has final cut. There's nothing I can do about that, but you're distributing the film. 
me and my mother don't like the soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> so, you could force him to take it off. Um, because you could just say to him, well, we won't distribute it properly unless you put proper music on. And he said, Leela, the, actually one of the main reasons I bought the film is because I really love the soundtrack. I'm a jazz musician, you know. He'd play, he met Charlie Parker for fuck's sake, and, yeah. you know. So, uh, unbeknownst to me, my angel was fluttering there and I, my, my ass was saved by John Kelly. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And it, 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 uh, as we all know, uh, Cage won Best Actor, didn't he? But mm -hmm. uh, uh, you were nominated for Screenplay for Director and Elizabeth Shue for yeah. Best Actress. And I lost that to Mel Gibson. They are sorry now. <laughs> yeah? I could have told them. The man's a yeah, racist. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, one of those films will like last and one won't. Know. How did that change your life? There you are. You're, you're, you're suddenly, uh, everyone wants like, lunch Wee! with you, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Again. Everyone wants lunch with Nicole Kidman figures. said, I would make the phone book with you. And I sent her a script. Unfortunately, not the phone book. You've got to learn your lesson. If she says the phone book, she means the phone book. Um, yeah, I was everybody's favorite for at least 10 minutes again. Um, and then I did One Night Stand, which tanked, but I think is a good film. Um, during this time, I mean, Leaving Las Vegas had been the big liberation. I shot on 16. I shot it myself with a DP, but I, I was on camera. Big, big important moment in my life. Um, and just the lightness of the equipment and the ability. We shot it in three weeks, yeah. you know. It looks um, very handsome. What, what, what was the story with shooting in, in, in Las Vegas? Was, was they that, said no. They said no. They yeah. read the script and said, alcoholism, it's a no-no here. Yeah, I would have thought. And how did you get to trash a, 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 lovely, a lovely casino like that? Uh, that was in Laughlin, <laughs> which is the geriatric version of Vegas. Uh, was with, I remember walking around the location and Danny Houston, had a, one of his first cameos in the film, said to the PR girl, I didn't know what he meant. He said, I have one question. What do you do with the bodies? And she knew exactly. She said, well, you know, we pretend they're asleep. We just get a wheelchair and we just <laughs> gent and we have a deal with a local undertaker. Because like, and I looked around and it was like, average age is about 500. <laughs> and this look, I remember this look of disgust because they have the massive thing of quarters, right? And then, <laughs> And you could see the fatigue, like how many more fucking quarters? And then, just as they're about to get to the bottom, it kind of goes, <laughs> and like another tub load comes yeah. out, and you look on their face, you can see they're close to death. Yeah, well, that would like, pay for the funeral, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's where we shot. You, you, you said once in an interview, to me a good film is a piece of magic, the result of a long and elaborate process of tricks and illusions. What, what do you think your best tricks and illusions are as a, as a director-writer? Um, I would say hopefully getting the story structure right and minimalistic enough so that you can add, as opposed to overwriting because I'm a screenwriter and that would be the end of my job. Mm -hmm. It's great having different jobs because you can totally piss on yourself once you move on to the next job. I have no romanticism about protecting myself as a writer once I'm directing. And editing, I have no romance about me being a director because the editing is, at that point, the most important thing. So getting the structure right helps, obviously. Giving the actors good places to be in so that when you get with them, you can... And because I was a performer for 10, 15 years, I know how hard it is for actors. And I know some of those tricks, so I, I, I love working with actors on, on their tricks, mm, you know. Mm. And so I don't ask actors to act, for yeah. example, which is like yeah. a good hint. That was, as we said, that was shot on 16 mil. You now tend to shoot a lot on digital. And I, I came and saw you do a talk at the NFT probably two or three years ago, I think, when your, your book about digital filmmaking came out. You said something really interesting then that has stayed with me for, well, ever since. You're talking about artists in general, whether they're writers, they're dancers, they're painters, they're, they're um, playwrights, sculptors. And you, you, you make the observation that all these artists, in some way in their life, make room to practice their craft, mm. to, to uh, try out stuff that might well get discarded or adapted or used in some other way. You said, Almost uniquely among artists, filmmakers don't do that, partly because of the, the economics. You can't just shoot a film and, and see mm -hmm. what happens. And um, the implication of what you were saying is that 
digital technology has freed up the artist, the, the filmmaker now to such an extent that you can actually go out and make a film. It doesn't cost you any, you don't have to buy film stock anymore. You edit on your, on, on your Mac. In your case, you do the music yourself, you write it yourself, and you can practice filmmaking. Do you think people do that now? In the light of what you said, I thought that's so eminently sensible that people would go out and do that. Do you think the business has changed at all that people do do that now? Or? I think so. I mean, it's a big conversation because the structure of film is unique. I mean, what a lot of the stuff that Gavin was saying um, struck chords with me about is it art, is it not art, is it cinema, is it not cinema, and a lot of the traps that filmmakers or artists fall into is wanting to be their own perception of what that person is. Mm -hmm. So the perception of a wannabe filmmaker is somebody who's sitting on a crane with a cap on backwards with a big <laughs> fucking 35 millimeter camera with about 25 people around it, everybody kind of, you know, like very masculine, big yeah. tool belts, yeah. trucks everywhere. Then you know you've arrived, you know. Um, and the most boring arrival of all time, by the way, but, you know, a sluggish, redundant system. Um, so, in a way, also that Gavin was saying that things have changed, and I, I think it's a very important point. So, whilst the old system of art and of filmmaking will stagger on because it's really about capitalism, nothing else, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't seen a good film come out of Hollywood for a long time. You know, if you look at what was happening in the 70s, early 70s, they're really good, a real zenith. Now it's over, like jazz is over, you know? Mm, mm, it mm. will continue to repeat itself because the economy is invested in it to such an extent that it's in everyone's interest to keep selling crap. So if you can free yourself from the perception of what is an artist or a filmmaker, and that I know of these individuals, yeah, you can go out there and just be so lightweight and the also letting go of the, the gold standard of you know 35 millimeter high definition low definition what a load of crap you mm. know i mean people are shooting tonight on a canon 7d yeah it's a revelation yeah. it's a really yeah. it's a gorgeous little instrument you mm. know and as were the pd 100 and things like that i mean cameras suddenly became useful mm. and also how about the fact that the artist i interviewed david lynch after he did inland empire and he said, I said, would you ever shoot on film again? And he went, he said, I love film, but I would rather die. <laughs> I would, and he said it five times, I would rather die. <laughs> and he couldn't get by, I would rather die. And it's like, how many ways can you say this? Like, you know, <laughs> I'd rather die than go back on film, you know. He said, I love those guys and I love what it does, but when you hold a camera in your hand and you're looking at an actor, and you just like, you want more light, put another light bulb in, yeah. you know, yeah. and the yeah. camera keeps running, you don't stop. Yeah. So you kind of go, that was really cool, do that again, I'm going to stand over here yeah. now, you know. Absolutely right, yeah. you know. Uh, but no, d d does it mean that the, 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 the technology leads to a democratization of the process, well, if you like, or does it mean it just leads to a proliferation of mediocre films because suddenly everyone's a filmmaker because they can be? That's okay. That's right. Everyone can be a writer. Everyone can be a bad writer. Uh, we still differentiate between good and bad in terms of our aesthetic taste and education and so on and so forth. I mean, the internet is full of bad writers. You know, mm. You're a fucking bitch, you know, if I, you know blah, blah, blah. You can, but there's also fantastic stuff on there as well. It's just a lot more crap to get through. Does, does the democratization hit the buffers because of distribution, ultimately? But All right, here's the main subject. Yeah, distribution. I mean, you can bitch about politics you blue in the face. Are you prepared to be an MP? Are you prepared to actually do something? Or are you just going to bitch about it? I mean, it's not a huge secret that distribution is fucked up. You know, it's a small pond, absolutely saturated with the most awful product, right? And it's a capitalistic problem. And they can't, God bless them, they cannot adjust quick enough. The digital revolution hit them so hard in the balls and they're still kind of going, ouch, ouch, what was that? I didn't even see it. Where was it? Did you see that? You know, they have no means. It's yeah. like an army and suddenly you drop an atomic bomb on them and they're all ready with their bows and arrows. And it's like, oh, I didn't even see the bomb coming, you yeah. know. And it came from behind and it was radiation. We didn't even see the explosion, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the same way. However, they still control the cinemas. So um, my plan is to make a feature now 
uh, which I've written. It's taken five years of thinking about do, not so much the story, but do I want to make another film like that? And I've come to the conclusion you can't just make a film, you have to make a cinema. So I'm going to make a film and, op and open a pop-up cinema to open it, mm. like The Bush would be if I did, wrote a play. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. All I want is a room that goes dark with seats more or less in the same direction, and yeah. a reasonable screen, yeah. and a reasonable projector. I mean, I've got a cheap one, and it's good. Mm. Good yeah. enough, we could show a movie in here, and it would be fine, you wouldn't complain. Yeah. The most important thing would be, is the sound system good? Bose speakers are great. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, run it off a Mac as a quick time, whatever. Yeah. Really, it's not, a, it's not rocket science anymore. Yeah. Look forward to that, definitely look forward to that. Um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd want to involve, what I've done is I've, I've taken the giant leap of becoming a, a Twitter, you know, against everything I ever said, but, um, and I'm going to open a Facebook account, but purely as, a, as my marketing tool for a kind of transparent work in progress of this, and I want to pick up an audience along the way. Part of the deal is also when you come out of a film, maybe not to be like repelled by the smell of popcorn and please leave because there's no... So I have a cool little room, a bit like this place. Yeah. You can have a hamburger or a bowl of pasta and some cool music yeah. to dance to, but it has to be acoustic. Yeah. And no electronic stuff. Yeah. Just so you could also have a conversation mm. whilst listening to music. Mm. Which is such a good idea. No, it's great. People used to have, you know. Put me down for a pound. Yeah. Um, um, I could talk to Mike for at least another three hours, but I think maybe it might be nice to throw this over to the floor now, because I know a lot of you have probably got questions that you'd like to ask Mike as well. So let's have some questions from the, from the floor. If you've got a question for Mike. Yeah. Uh, we have had one from you. If we just have... Um, you, you mentioned earlier on that you, that you still occasionally teach at Beckinsfield. If you had a group, if like we were a group of your first year students if you were to sort of send us away with one little maxim about the state of filmmaking in Britain at the moment or like to encourage mm -hmm. young filmmakers what, what would that be and why, what and why I think it would be organized did you already have a question what would I say to a group of young filmmakers um, it's what I do often say which is organize you know if you look at <clears throat> a good example would be the Nouvelle Vague right a bunch of, let's say, film nuts, critics, or people who loved film and wrote about film, who decided to make films and then kind of get m more involved. So they formed a group. That I don't know how heavily they got into distribution, but that is the biggest challenge now. Because before, to be a distributor, you had to think about a brick and mortar problem, projectors, the economics of running a space. Whereas pop-up is um, it's fine. It could be anywhere, and projectors can go in the back of your car. So I would say organize a group that has um, the ability to deal with you know, production, direction, and so on, and homemade distribution with, with intelligent use of the internet. I don't doubt the talent that, that is, you know, Britain always, interestingly, has thrown up such great talent in all forms of the arts, and will continue to do so, something to do with, fucking freezing, I don't know what it is, or we have bad government, I don't know what it is, but it's, it sort of works for art. And um, just organize and don't delude yourself that you can jump over a fence, because you'll just hit a bigger fence at some point, and you'll get screwed at some point. If you get successful, you're in trouble. Whereas if you're in control of your own ability to make and, and show a film, like, like, like other people could do, you know, in, in different art forms, well, it's a big subject, and you know, I'd say the same to galleries, and I'd say the same to all kind of different forms of art, but yeah, I would say that. Um, would you say the same thing to a group of young musicians? I think they've already, in a way, seen the way. You know, uh, I think musicians, I mean, you look at the state of uh, record companies now, <clears throat> I think that's, that augurs what's going to happen to the film companies, and already is, but you know, they're showing the way. And then the internet, you know, it's really interesting because it didn't kill the music industry. Um, and actually, in many cases, it was much more beneficial for the musicians and put power back into them than creative power. You mm. Think of all the crap about marketing that bands had to go through when they can do their own image, you know, which has got much more to do with their peer group and so on. And also, what's really cool is the idea 
that filmmaking doesn't have to be about world domination. Um, and I say that as a joke, as a serious joke. But, you know, part of the idea of being a successful Ridley Scott type filmmaker was, was some idea of world domination, you know, and being on the top 100 most powerful people in the world list and so on. Spielberg, you know, all those guys. So rich. You think, why, why don't you just make a good film? You're so fucking rich. Aren't you bored being boring by now? You know? <laughs> I mean, really, you know. You're going to die. What are you going to say in your deathbed? That, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm so rich and so boring. I feel so happy as I die that I've bored so many people. You know, and, uh, you know, what the hell's the point of that? So I think, yeah, you, you know, the tools are there. Almost all you need is the heart and the encouragement from somebody who's been around the block a bit, like me, to say, you can do that. You know, I'm not saying you will be instantly successful. And also, I don't really know whether you're any good. That's up to you. But you'd certainly have a camera possibility, editing possibilities, and now with the internet distribution possibilities. Mm. Mm. And if you don't care so much about quality, again, like Gavin was saying, it's like, does it have to be perfect? No. I mean, best example was Festin. You know, that's like, by now, even by video standards, that was like appallingly bad quality. Mm. But it's beautiful. And it could have been shot on anything, 16, 35, end of the day, it's a great story. But he did it dogma style, and it's fantastic. It's one of the great films, you know? And it, proving that it doesn't really matter what you shoot on if you get your act together, mm. you know? Mm. And, and dogma was a very good example, kind of comic example, I think, of. I think they were taking the piss with the, with the charter and everything, but uh, <laughs> and I think they must have got really Danish drunk all night and go, yes, let's make it even more difficult. No guns, yeah, that's better. No blood, no music, yeah, fuck them, you know. It's like, yes, yeah, so let's, let's worship at the Shrine of Dogma. But they made their point, and because there was a bunch of them, they were a gang, you know, and they gave them a huge amount of power with their yeah. Mickey Mouse statue yeah. outside the studio, you know. Another question, yeah. How important is genre in, in Mike's filmmaking, or does the genre arise out of the project? Well, I think, you know, like, <coughs> like the artist thing, you end up, in a way, adapting <coughs> existing genres, because you were informed by what you saw. So I was informed very much by Goddard as being the first real turn-on, as I'm like, wow, that is so cool, you can make a film that way. Uh, but then also, Bonnie and Clyde was a, you know, like a massive, you know, emotional... Um, uh, influence to me, uh, as were obviously Italian films and so on. So little bits of those go into a, a new thing, which is your version, of your, your own genre. But certain, I'd say this, there are certain rules which are worth learning about camera movement, which have been completely and utterly disregarded through the plethora of equipment. So, you know, the other thing is like, you give someone a piece of equipment, they feel they have to use it. Give them a zoom, they'll zoom. Give them a crane, they'll crane. Mm. It's disastrous results, right? It's like, whoa, whoa, you know. If they're going to do dogma, they feel they have to do dogma, you know, and so on. <laughs> so these genres are destructive, you know. It's like, they're all there to be, you know, abused or kind of adapted or, you know. But there are certain key things like, if you move the camera, ask yourself the question, why are you moving the camera? Why? Is it because you're bored? Or is it because the story's not very good and you're trying to create some fake tension? Because if you waited until the right moment and moved the camera, it really would be terribly powerful, you know? So this, to learn moderation in, in technique in, in cinema, I think, is very important as a genre in itself. The, um, the reason I asked the question is I've had uh, some Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, no. I mean, the, it was a story. I yeah. wanted to write a particular story, and I hadn't really thought about genre initially. Mm. Then all of a sudden, everyone was saying, okay, you know, all right, you did this, or blah, blah, blah. I don't think you want to do it. You want to make a horror film that you want to do. So the horror film, and everyone's not. Um, but there 
seems to have kind of grown up an interest in this idea of genre when you talk to people at the film council. For oh. example, I'm not saying that that's a good thing. I'm just saying I have to do but it. But it isn't the phrase, the film council. <laughs> 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 Hello, I work for the Film Council. Really? Mm, mm. What do you do? You know, we, we council, you know, films or whatever, you know. I mean, all these things, the Arts Council, you know, the film funding, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you're immediately up against non-filmmakers who are dealing with smoke. So how do you quantize smoke? That's what a film is or an idea is, right? Um, what do you do? You have to give it like, okay, you have to start going, well, we have to write stuff down on paper. And so we need headlines, headings. And so these genres become mm. boxes to tick and so mm. on. And that's all they are. Mm. Critics are the, you know, my God, you know, uh, you know the way they, they talk about genre and they talk about film theory. I mean, it's just dreadful, you know. It's the ultimate death toll, you know. It's mm. once that power base gets too big, you know, so you know, regularly people are going, to go, "Fuck you, I, I, I'm, I don't want to have anything to do with you." It's quite interesting when the film council folded, and I got a call from the Guardian saying, "You know, tragic news. You know, do you want to make a, say something?" And I thought, "I should, I'm tragic. I should really say something." And then I've read something Alex Cox had said. <laughs> he went, "Film council? I don't give a flying fuck. What have they ever done for me?" What have <laughs> What have they ever done for anything except like throw money back towards Hollywood or throw to, or yeah. towards five weddings and a thing of me or whatever? You know what I mean? It's like, what the hell has that got to do with the creative aspects of filmmaking? You know, and you don't need them. You know, it's like, and if you are dependent on that kind of cash, you're already in a way, you're already in a bit of a jam. You know. Is there one more short question, Richard? Who is the English film director you most admire, if he exists? Um, I'm a big John, he's not English, that's okay, John Borman, I, you know, I watched Deliverance again the other day, and, you know, I like filmmakers that consistently, you know, work, you know, and, and pop up with something, just good work, good work, interesting work, great with actors, you know, you know, obviously Nick Rogue, you know, he's having a nice renaissance right now, but that little period when he was working, uh, but again, Donald Camel was very much part of mm. that, and that's a whole mm. other subject too. Um, Ken Loach, you know, it just works, consistently works well. And I like the big picture, I like, you know, not that film, because we all make, we all have, you know, we all set out to make a really good film every time, everybody does. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So what you look at is the perseverance of people like Loach and John Borman, and they really give you hope, because, you know, they're both getting on a bit now, you know, and John still struggles to raise money. Um, he really does, you know, like he's a bloody film student or something, you know, and the guys, are, the films he made in America, my God, they are absolutely genius. And so interesting to see that British take on Americana fed by the Nouvelle Vague as well. So you get, you know, a, you know, a rare example of a real cinematic synthesis in some of those directors, mm. particularly Borman, you know. I mean, those films are phenomenal. I don't know if you've seen Deliverance again recently, but it is, it's almost like a perfect film. You know, and you, things like in the famous, you know, banjo duet, you know, a trick question, at what point in the film does that occur? At the beginning. Right at the beginning. They get it out of the way, it becomes the theme music, and then this weird banjo mm. stuff that then, it's really creepy that as you get further into the film. It really is a remarkable film. John Borman, I would say. It's been a lovely evening. I'd like to say thank you so much both to Gavin Turk and to Mike Figgis. Thanks a lot, Mike. Fantastic. Thank you all for coming. Let's meet up for a drink in the bar, yes?